Not only have I been to nearly every post-Soviet country to learn more about the food, culture, and languages of this part of the world. Do you hear that? I also have a degree in Soviet and Slavic history. For the last 11 years, I've lived in the post-Soviet sphere, working with local governments and NGOs. Kiev has been my home for 9 of those 11 years. Being in Ukraine when the war started and my knowledge and experience in the area give me the background to help a Western audience better understand what is happening here and why. To understand the current conflict and the sum of its constituent parts, we need to examine the very nexus of Eastern Slavic culture, Kievan Rus. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Kievan Rus. Both Russia and Ukraine claim sole ownership of the Kievan Rus legacy, and with it, the mantle of father of all Slavic peoples. While the three most vital cities in Kievan Rus were Novgorod and modern Russia, and Chernihiv and Kiev and modern Ukraine, this overlooks the fact that modern Belarus and even parts of Poland were under Kievan Rus. So these claims of ownership of this ancient kingdom need to be taken with a lot of sized grain of salt. The truth is that neither nation can claim ownership or sole heritage when the reality is that their relationship to Kievan Rus is that of a common ancestor, not an unbroken line of direct succession. So the very basis of this argument is a bit pointless. It would be like if Homo sapiens and Neanderthals debated over who was the one true progeny of Australopithecines. What elevates this claim from harmless rah-rah we are awesome patriotism to incredibly dangerous propaganda is when one country uses this irrelevant claim as divine right to assert influence or justify an invasion, defending it as a return of what was once theirs. This is so absurd that if you follow the Kremlin's own logic, Norway has a better claim to Kiev than they do, as the ruling family of Kievan Rus, the Ruriks, were from Scandinavia. In fact, the list of modern nations that at one point controlled a part of Ukraine is quite extensive. Greece, Mongolia, Turkey, Lithuania, Lithuania and Poland, Poland, Austria and Hungary, and Romania. In short, history is not nearly as clear-cut as a bumper sticker or political slogan makes it seem. The sense of Russian lordship over Ukraine and all Slavic territory that stems from the misconception that they, and only they, were born from this ancient dynasty is not only wrong, but incredibly dangerous. Especially considering that since Kievan Rus fell more than 500 years prior to the integration of the potato into Slavic culture, its influence on modern Slavic existence is more myth than daily reality, and certainly not a justification for bombing children. Tsarist Russian control. From a defensive standpoint, one of the biggest disadvantages of Ukraine would have to be its geographical location. Flat open plains with the only boundaries being the Black Sea to the south, the Carpathian Mountains to the southwest, the Pripyat Marshes in the north, and the Dnieper River splitting the region in half, this openness allowed for very easy movement through the region and led to long periods of shifting control and instability. Following the Mongol conquest of Kievan Rus, the kingdom collapsed, the region splintered, and was later controlled by different local powers. The Lithuanian Kingdom, then the Polish-Lithuanian Duchy, then the Polish Kingdom, with differing shifts in allegiance and control until a Cossack group established a hetmanate controlling a large portion of what is now central Ukraine. The leader, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, realized the threat of being sandwiched between the Poles and the Russians, and in the 1654 Periaslav Agreement, pledged allegiance to the Tsar, thinking that they were both orthodox and thus more culturally similar, in exchange for protection from the Polish. When the truth is, no one can save you from the Polish. I mean, look at these guys. Over time, the Russians overstepped the bounds of the treaty until the territory was subsumed by Russia and the Hetmanate eventually disbanded, establishing a long-held regional distrust against the Russian Empire. It is worth noting that at this time, the very concept of Ukraine as a nation did not exist and no one from this time period would have claimed themselves to be Ukrainian and the Ukrainian language was not developed. These are typical points that Russophiles like to endlessly harp on about. To address the issue of the tangled web of Christmas lights that is the Slavic language family, there's a video linked in the description that gives a great breakdown of the history of the Russian language and, less directly, Ukrainian. Long story short, Neither language were fully baked until much later.
Additionally, the concept of nationhood was not really how people of the time would self-identify. People were more likely to categorize themselves by the city of birth, ruling class, or whom they directly served. Just because the concept of being Ukrainian emerged later does not mean it didn't have an established culture and traditions. For comparison, the very concept of Germany and Italy did not exist until roughly the 1870s, when both nations unified. Ukrainian independence. Kinda. Speaking of nationalism, the rise in nationalism that spread across Europe and led to World War I also found purchase with Ukrainians. Under the Tsarist yoke, the Ukrainian national identity solidified. Ukraine was no longer just a reference to a geographical location or a generalization of the edge of the frontier, nor were the people tolerant of being given the label Malorusi. With a firmly established language, separate cultural identity, and a strong sense of self-determination, the Ukrainian people sought independence. Following the collapse of the Russian Empire, various ethno-groups scrambled to unify into a singular fighting force capable of securing territory. Ukrainians, Russians, Ruthenians, Hutsuls, and other minority groups tried to establish a singular Ukraine in the West. Overlapping claims of territory with Polish groups led to direct conflict in the Ukrainian-Polish War. While Western Ukraine was struggling with Poland, in the East, the newly established Bolsheviks were pressuring Ukraine from Kharkiv and moving into Kiev. Even with Eastern and Western Ukraine eventually unified, it was too little too late. Ukraine was unable to firmly establish itself and was conquered in just a few years. The territory split under the control of the newly formed Soviet Union and the Second Polish Republic. Soviet Ukraine while the dream of Ukrainian independence was dashed under Soviet subjugation, Ukrainian resistance continued. Even though the face of the new boss had a new name, Soviet, Ukrainians saw the mostly Russian leadership as a continuation of Russian imperialism, and so old grudges continued unadulterated. Following Stalin's rise to power, purges swept through the entirety of the Soviet Union and were meant to break the will of anyone who could possibly step out of line. These purges would later reach their crescendo in the Great Terror of 1936 to 1938. Ongoing purges, coupled with the executed Renaissance, left the area strained but still standing. This was a problem for Moscow. Holodomor Standard practice within the Soviet Union included mass nationalization of privately held land and property. In an effort to modernize, the Soviet Union began exporting grain for profit and supplemental crops were brought in from rural areas to feed factory workers as urban populations rose. Any holdouts or slightly successful farmers were labeled as kulaks, literally fist in Russian, and they were either robbed, jailed, deported to Siberia, or straight up executed. Kulak originally was a term given to the wealthy, but this later grew to be anyone the state wanted to denounce. Simultaneously, Large swaths of farmland were unified into kalhoz, or communal farms, where production was centralized and crops were taken by the state under governmental collectivization. Ukrainians resisted this practice by subversion or outright sabotage, underreporting harvests, stashing food and livestock, or just slaughtering herds and burning crops rather than surrendering them to the Bolsheviks. Collectivization was ramped up in Ukraine to the point where a man-made famine was created. Over the course of nearly two years, Ukrainians were systematically starved in a targeted attempt to break the region and decimate the population while funding Stalin's first five-year plan. The Holodomor, which means death by starvation or hunger, killed around 4.2 million Ukrainians in a genocidal act of Soviet rage. Entire towns vanished under the weight and destruction of the forced starvation. An often overlooked and largely unknown horror of unimaginable cruelty that further poisoned Ukrainian-Russian relations as generations of Ukrainian heritage was systematically exterminated. The Aftermath of World War II Without dwelling on the specifics of the war, suffice it to say that Ukraine was absolutely devastated during World War II. Having previously been conquered by the Soviets and Poles, many saw the German invaders as liberators, until the Nazi ideology was unleashed against the populace. 16.3% of the Ukrainian population did not survive the war. The only nations with higher losses were Poland, 
with a similar 17.07%, and Belarus with a staggering 25.3% of the population. These three countries were hit the hardest because they were utterly steamrolled twice by two separate armies, the Wehrmacht and the Red Army, in just a four-year span. With Ukraine going through the First World War, a war for independence, a civil war, political purges, a genocidal famine, and now World War II, the suffering and loss experienced by Ukrainians in just 31 years is unimaginable. Transfer of Crimea In 1954, Khrushchev added the Crimean Peninsula to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. While largely an administrative move, it created a lot of friction between Ukraine and Russia, even while unified under Soviet rule. This combined with post-war expansion would establish Ukrainian borders that would remain unchanged until 2014. Chernobyl General Soviet incompetence and mismanagement created a nuclear disaster on Ukrainian soil which has since left the country scarred forever. While not born out of malice, the disaster resulted in the poisoning of Ukraine for thousands of years and did nothing to improve Ukrainian-Russian relations and Ukrainians' general distrust of Soviet authority. These are just the highlights, but the bulk of Soviet-Ukrainian interaction, especially in the pre-war phase of Soviet rule, was marked by near-constant forced deportations, famines, collectivization, cultural erasure, political suppression, linguistic imperialism, and economic subjugation. Not a great way to treat your brother nation. But the collapse of the Soviet Union would finally lead to a free and untethered Ukraine, a nation able to write its own destiny. Uh, right? Post-Soviet Ukraine with the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of the former republics were thrown into chaos. While the Baltics were the quickest to recover and immediately turned towards Europe, the Slavic Republic seemed to be consumed with corruption and infighting as those in control of the soon-to-be-privatized resources started to fill the vacuum Soviet power and nationalized property once held. Ukraine, after centuries of trying, was finally able to establish a nation-state. However, while Ukraine was independent, this did not mean they were free from Russian influence. President Leonid Kravchuk Kravchuk assumed power during the collapse of the Soviet Union, but was later confirmed president via general election. His presidency was largely considered ineffectual but not detrimental to the country. I, for one, think he did something that is incredible. Upon losing his bid for re-election, he did what many others in his position did not. He ceded power. As you can see, the turnover of leaders in the post-Soviet sphere leaves a lot to be desired. The lower the turnover, the higher the likelihood of an authoritarian regime. The Budapest Memorandum Ukraine surrenders its nuclear arsenal in exchange for financial aid and assurances from the US, UK, and Russia that military force or economic coercion will never be used against Ukraine agreed upon by Kravchuk and signed by Kuchma, now one of Russia's most infamous political betrayals. President Kuchma On a more pro-Russian stance, Kuchma tried to normalize political ties with Russia and improve economic conditions in Ukraine. However, he seemed to only establish an oligarchy in Ukraine and extend corruption as economic conditions for the average Ukrainian did not vastly improve. 2004 Elections The 2004 elections in Ukraine marked a turbulent time in Ukrainian politics. With Kuchma not running, the race was between Viktor Yushchenko and Viktor Yanukovych, who was prime minister under Kuchma. With Yanukovych backed by current president Kuchma and the Russian government, Yushchenko, with his pro-EU platform, had an uphill battle. And I know these names seem quite similar for non-Slavic tongues, but you can use this mnemonic device to remember the difference. Yanukovych rhymes with Putin's bitch. Yushchenko poisoning. As Yushchenko gained steam politically, Russian allies within Ukraine, possibly directed by Putin himself, initiated a failed assassination attempt that left Yushchenko disfigured and pockmarked, but unbowed. 
he continued his election drive. Orange Revolution The Orange Revolution was kicked off following reports of voter fraud and corruption in the runoff election that declared Yanukovych the victor. Protests led by Yushchenko and Timoshenko resulted in them emerging as political leaders of Ukraine. The revolution ended with Yanukovych acquiescing and leaving office, quoting how he wanted to avoid Ukrainian bloodshed. President Yushchenko Considered a leader with good intentions, he was never able to gain the support to drive his initiatives. Seen as meek and uninspiring, he lacked a certain charisma that most leaders innately possess. This is on top of ruling during the disastrous 2008 financial crisis, which hit Ukraine especially hard. He quickly fell out of favor. His Orange Revolution political ally, Demoshenko, became his prime minister following his election. But the relationship soon soured as she turned into his political rival and gained widespread support. Yushchenko's refusal to drop out of the 2010 elections allegedly siphoned enough votes away from Demoshenko to result in a victory for Yanukovych. President Yanukovych With Yanukovych unable to steal the election in 2004 and being deposed in the Orange Revolution, he returned in the 2010 election to win over Timoshenko. As a 6 foot 3 inch convicted criminal and wannabe thug, Yanukovych was the living embodiment of post-Soviet corruption. If the rule of the other presidents represented political purgatory, corruption, and stagnation, then the reign of Yanukovych was a horrific amalgamation of the three. Doing an about-face on the dreams of joining the EU and NATO, Yanukovych more closely aligned Ukraine with Russia while robbing the country blind. Yanukovych attempted to establish more authoritarian control over Ukraine by extending the lease of Russian naval bases in Crimea, which led to rioting in Parliament, and jailed his political rival, Demoshenko, on corruption charges. The association agreement between the EU and Ukraine was a long-awaited starting point to bring Ukraine more in line with EU regulations and grant them preferred access to European trade markets. The agreement would provide access to financial and institutional assistance in exchange for modernizing the legal, financial, judicial, and political systems of Ukraine while simultaneously securing energy and food exports from Ukraine to the EU a mutually beneficial package that was seen by many as Ukraine's first step towards EU membership, and a rejection of the Russian shadow they had long been under. Euromaidan Revolution All of the other events previously mentioned are contextual background to the current war in Ukrainian-Russian relations. The Maidan Revolution is the real starting point. All future events leading to war can trace their roots directly to this moment as it represents a deep and undeniable rejection of Russian authority over Ukrainian sovereignty. Following Yanukovych's refusal to sign the EU agreement, student protesters descended on Kiev's main square with more widespread demonstrations on the 24th, which I personally attended. Protesters eventually started living on the square as a sort of village was established within the city center. The Ukrainian government responded with continually escalating violence until over a hundred Ukrainians were killed by sniper fire as they marched on parliament. In the wake of the killings, Ukrainian outrage was so intense that the Yanukovych regime fled to Russia, where they are still in exile. This, of course, is a gross oversimplification. I highly recommend seeing Winter on Fire on Netflix if you would like an accurate and detailed account of the horrors and bravery that were put on display. The jubilation and pride of victory was short-lived as Russia was no longer happy playing puppet master and wanted direct control over Ukraine. The Maidan Revolution was an insult that Russia could not tolerate as they increased their subversive activity in Ukraine and unleashed a new form of digital propaganda and psyops that would echo throughout politics the world over. Continued in Part 2